Welcome to the Wealth Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, John Lawson, Senior Wealth Advisor at Asante Capital Management and Sauna Family Office. We're always looking for ways to educate our client families and be introduced to new clients. At Sauna Family Office, we help business owners and affluent families navigate the complexities of wealth through a variety of wealth management and family enterprise oversight services. Today on the Wealth Wisdom Podcast, we have Drummond Brodeur back by popular demand for his recap of 2022 and outlook for 2023. Drummond is a Senior Vice President and Global Strategist for CI Global Asset Management. And with over 30 years of experience, he's one of our go-to experts to get the big picture of just what is happening in the world of economies, why and how that equates to our investments. Happy New Year and welcome back, Drummond. I know our viewers and listeners have uh, really enjoyed this episode in the past years. And given the ups and downs in the market and economies, uh, I suspect they're really looking forward to uh, hearing your thoughts on what happened in 2022. But more to the point, uh, to set the stage for what you see happening in 2023. Very good. Fair enough. It's, uh, as I say, good to see you again, John. And it certainly comes after what was a pretty uh, volatile, let's say, year in 2022 <laughs> with a lot of unexpected turns and shifts. Yeah, um, just, so, a, uh, just a few. Um, so I was jotting down uh, some notes on this. And uh, in uh, 2022, what I wrote down was uh, supply chain issues, inflation, rate hikes, war, fear, and repeat. Uh, it seems we yeah. went through a few of those uh, uh, cycles uh, in there. Uh, yeah. And to boot, there was no Santa Claus this year, uh, to quote from, uh, I think it was one of your articles in November. Uh, exactly. Yeah, he, he sort of faded into December. So we did a, we did a, we had a reasonable quarter, but it definitely December was uh, tailed off in a just, you know, explanation part for what was a pretty miserable year for markets. Yeah, so let's uh, let's start with your thoughts uh, and quick recap of uh, 2022. And as always, when it, when it comes to this one, one thing I do is I write outlooks quite often. So I did go back and look, what were we thinking last year, as opposed to revisionist history? Um, what did we write, and what did uh, what did we see, and what you know what went wrong, and how what might influence that? As I say, as we go through forward, and if you look at the basic fundamental outlook that we. Uh, sort of got right was that we were basically heading into a slowing economy, tightening monetary cycle. Um, inflation was uh, was was a problem, um, which is why we're tightening monetary policy and it should be slowing down. Expectations a year ago in the bond market forecast in the market by the Fed uh, was that interest rates would be right increased three times to roughly one percent. Uh, over the course of 2022. So right there is okay. We got the direction right order of magnitude, not even in the same ballpark. So as I say, with interest rates today up 400 basis points um, is, uh, is really all you need to know in terms of what really drove markets. Um, and it ended up obviously setting off you know, one of the worst uh, bond market returns for an individual year uh, in history. I think for the US 10 year market it was the worst since 1874. So like really um, outlier type of performance years uh, for uh, for um, uh, particularly in the bond market, and of course, when the bond market interest rates go up, has that knock on effect into resetting valuations and other prices, and so the equity markets sell off much more significant than we uh, than we had anticipated a year ago. Um, but we had anticipated going down. We did. We were selling reducing exposures a year ago coming into the year because we knew the direction we we're going in. As I say, order of magnitude just completely off the charts. Nowhere. In my outlook piece from last year, John, absolutely nowhere did I write we were going to have a war. But what I did highlight at the time were the two big risks that we had to watch out for last year would be, one, that inflation is more problematic than expected, uh, and two, that geopolitical issues might be coming uh, more of a problem, which, uh, which I just briefly mentioned, the U.S. domestic politics, China, Russia, uh, and, and Iran. So got those two issues and those were the two kind of uh, as i say didn't pay enough attention they might say but really the market themes in 2022 the inflation and monetary policy much stronger than expected and the geopolitical the russian war 
uh, in the Ukraine, which is a geopolitical issue, but importantly, really sort of uh, hyper uh, drove the inflation issue and the problem through the energy price. And so if you look at the inflation trajectory last year, we came in, it was strong. It's, if I look at CPI, it essentially peaked in the summer overall uh, and in the US, I'm looking, talking mostly US data here, similar uh, applies to Canada. But if you actually look at the just X, including food and energy, it really peaked much earlier in the year, four or five months earlier. So it was really that Ukraine war driving energy and food prices that aggravated that inflationary trend and forced a much more significant response from monetary policy. So it did have uh, a pretty significant in, uh, impact on ultimate outcomes in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in markets. Perfect. That's a, uh, a very, very good uh, recap tight and uh, drilled right down really to the causes uh, and drivers of it. So uh, let's uh, polish up your crystal ball and uh, talk about expectations for 2023. And, uh, and of course, we'll have to uh, uh, come back in a year from now and uh, see how you did. Um, but what I'm going to do is give you a few cues uh, and uh, you give me kind of your best one minute or less answer uh, for, for each one. And uh, I know that's kind of a, a tight time frame, but uh, let's see if we can do yeah. it. If you go a little over, I won't give you the hook. Yeah, exactly. And if I can make one caveat ahead of time before we launch off on this, and it's going to be, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's relevant. Um, and as I say, you know, sort of riffing off Yogi Berra, uh, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, and it gets to the point that, uh, you know, what, what we saw last year in the mist, uh, but also even are we, where we are today, the overall global economy is still in a massive state of disequilibria. Dis dis the shocks to the system from the pandemic, from the massive monetary fiscal response, uh, from the war of the Ukraine. These are huge exogenous shocks that sort of knock the system out of equilibria. And it makes a lot of the economic sort of um, patterns, it, it, it dislodges them. And so a lot of the data, a lot of the, uh, the patterns that we're not in equilibria. And that, therefore, forecasting is a much lower degree of confidence when we look forward. And I say that not just to say the only the only sure forecast I know I'm going to get right is that my forecast will be wrong. Okay, that's that's the one thing I know I will get right. Um, but it's it's and it's not it's not just being facetious though because it does influence how we manage money and we think about it. And when you have a much lower degree of confidence, you just have to be more you know cautious and recognize that the degree of outcomes have a much range, wider range. Uh, and therefore, what we're doing even last year, uh, yeah, we know what some of the issues are. We're watching them as the data evolves and changes we're also forced to respond as we go forward as opposed to saying, here's a point forecast, we're gonna make a thing and stick to it. It's like, no, let's recognize higher elevated degree of uncertainty than usual. Uh, and therefore just be more, uh, you know, more cautious in terms of, uh, of uh, how you uh, sort, of, um, uh, sort of react and, uh, and manage money going forward in, 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 that, in that area. So, um, yep. yeah, so as I said, that's my caveat for whatever I get wrong. I'm making my excuses up front, you might say. <laughs> no, that's uh, that's completely fair. And uh, it's always the facetious polish up the crystal ball. But because uh, uh, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, we are trying to uh, paint a picture of what we see. But I think what uh, a really good point to what you're referring to there is... Um, this we're coming uh, while well, we have been in a period and we're certainly I think can going to continue through and probably see even a greater degree of this where uh, it, it's a I heard a, a, a recap of a nursery rhyme uh, the other day uh, Jack be nimble Jack be quick is the uh, yep. order of the day for uh, money management uh, yep. uh, for for the next while which which really means um, you need to have good active management and uh, teams like yourselves, your team and the rest of our teams uh, to, to take advantage of uh, uh, opportunities because that is another piece of this. Uh, whenever something, uh, quote, bad happens, um, what that really creates, it creates fear and fear creates opportunity. Yes. Uh, yep. so where maybe something is getting pummeled, but, uh, well, last year there were very few places to, to go hide and take advantage of, but, uh, uh um, eventually that creates opportunity. Yeah. So, 
Uh, with that said, let's uh, let's tackle the first question. And so first is inflation. Where do you yeah. see that going and what's going on with that? Right at the core of uh, what drove markets this year and what will continue to drive markets this year. And in particular, the, the you know what's happening to inflation, how central banks will interpret it. So inflation, as we come through 2020, I think it is coming back down. And I think it's going to sort of come back down quicker than a lot of people expect. Um, and so when you look at it, and even if I look at the U.S. Uh, sort of headline inflation uh, in uh, in the U.S., if you look just the past six months since it started coming down, uh, assuming that the December number comes out as expected, headline CPI in the U.S. is currently running at just 2.3% uh, over the past uh, you know, six-month period. So already substantially down from those eight, nines, 10% period. So we, the big surprise was how quickly we ramped up on inflation, aggravated by energy and food. And I think there's a surprise as those fall out of the numbers, uh, then that we could see that inflation collapse much quicker. We're already seeing deflation in the good side. That's kind of that supply chain issue driven things. Cars are coming on lots, inventory is building up, discounting. We got deflation in the good sector. Energy, we're not at 120 oil anymore coming down, continuing to be disinflationary uh, as well. And hopefully food should follow that down as well. So those components, very cyclical, should start actually contributing to uh, more disinflation as we go through this year. And then the real catch-all, the one that people are going to care about or central banks are going to care about, it's going to be the labor market. What's happening to wage inflation? This is more important than all the rest. So we could see very much weaker overall numbers. But if I don't see weaker labor, uh, labor market or wage data, then I think central banks are going to be more biased to saying tighter than otherwise. So not all inflation drivers are created equal. Watch the labor data. We need wage growth to be getting down below uh, into a three uh, to four percent trend rate. It cannot be above four percent. That is fundamentally inconsistent with a two percent inflation target of price stability. If I mean, you can think of two percent inflation, two percent productivity means ceiling on wage growth, which is about seventy percent of the cost base, is kind of at four percent. So. That's what we got to see down. Looser labor markets, higher unemployment. That's what central banks are trying to do. Um, they will get disinflation, but it has to also be seen showing up in weaker labor markets. Great. And so two, two questions on that. Um, first, do you see a trend in the labor market? Is it starting to uh, weaken? And secondly, uh, it seems, and this is uh, long-term memory, uh, but it seems to me labor can uh, sometimes make up 65, 70% of inflation. Is that correct? Yeah, and particularly in the services side. So, and that's where, as I say, if you look at goods and a lot of that's more important than supply chain issues. Services, it's all about uh, sort of wages uh, and, uh, and labor markets. And we are seeing it soften and coming down. We're seeing unemployment. It's been very resilient so far. That's when there's been one surprise this year with that tightening. It's been how resilient the economies have been so far and labor markets. So, you know, that's one positive is that there's, you know, been much stronger than expected. Um, but we are seeing signs that it is slowing down. And a lot of the labor market data as well, uh, and the wage data is also related to so, so the supply side shocks. Uh, and so there's a lot of one-off factors in there. If you think of, you know, we basically shut down the service economy. So, you know, in the U.S., it was like 20, 30 million people sent home, lost their jobs. Well, they didn't just sit around for two years and do nothing. They went, you know, they had to put food on the table. Yes, there was support. But so you saw a lot of that reallocation of that labor when the economy shut down elsewhere. Okay, massive hiring into sort of uh, logistics areas, uh, you know, just think of uh, and uh, online Amazon warehouses, etc. So a lot of reallocation of labor to where it was needed. Uh, and then when we tried to reopen the economy and the service that you're running a restaurant, say, okay, when all the wait staff and bartenders back, well, they're not sitting at home waiting for you. They've gone. And so all of a sudden, this supply shock, this big demand shock for labor as you reopen, it takes time for the economy to reallocate labor back towards where it's needed again. And these, it plays out in quarters and years, not days and weeks. And so that's part of this issue. And when you need to uh, attract sort of a labor, you got to, you know, you end up paying higher prices. Um, but if I was paying $15 for a bartender an hour and they went away and I try and get them back, they're not coming back for 15, they're doing something else. You know, so he said, okay, they said, oh, okay, we'll come back for 20. So you end up paying 20, you know, 30% increase from what you were paying, but you're not paying them 25 next year. And that's when inflation starts to fall off as, as labor markets also recalibrate and get back 
closer to some sense of equilibria, uh, that we should continue to see softness in the wage growth, uh, even if unemployment is slower to, to rise overall. So, but that will be the key area that we in central banks are watching to see that that is, um, is, uh, is easy enough. And certainly you see the layoff announcements, et cetera, coming up. You see housing markets getting hurt. So that's a very big labor intensive area. So everything's pointing to 2023 that those labor markets, they are lagging indicators. We will see that softness coming, uh, coming through in, uh, in through 2023. Great explanation. Thanks, Drummond. And I think you made a key point there, which uh, I think last time we talked, I reiterated, and that is uh, people have to remember that uh, um, the inflation is a year-over-year -year measurement. So that's why you keep talking about the big numbers falling off. And uh, and so uh, it's a key, key distinction when we're, when we're looking at the bigger picture. Uh, so you've alluded to this a couple times, Bank of Canada uh, rate hikes. Where are we? What do you what do you think is going to happen there? Okay, so rate hikes, and this is all last year. We start we basically started zero. Okay, inflation's up, interest rates down, central banks way behind where they should have been. So we they spent all last year trying to play catch up, getting back to neutral towards a tightening level. So very different dynamic than today, where they've got four hundred uh, sort of. Uh, uh, basis for 400 basis points of rate hikes in. So the Bank of Canada is at 425 uh, in their overnight rate above the rate of neutral. So they've already put the tightening in, front loaded it last year, um, and they're pretty well done. We'll see uh, later this month, I think it's around January 25th, the next Bank of Canada meeting. Uh, do they go another 25 basis points or are they done? Um, and I expect they're probably done. Um, but it goes back to that more resilient data. We're still seeing, you know, slightly, we're seeing stronger data coming through, even if it's in, in, in it's often lagging indicators that is sort of pushing, you know, may force them to take out another uh, uh, sort of, you know, 25 basis point increase insurance to make sure the economy is slowing down, inflation is slowing down. Um, but Bank of Canada, I think is pretty close to be done. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And uh, so then uh, south of the border, uh, Fed rate hikes. Yeah, so the Fed, and basically we're at the same level now. They're also at 425, the lower band, 425, 450. Uh, their next meeting's in February. They're going to go one more time, I believe. I think there's a good chance in our 25 basis points in the Fed, and then they're done. Now, this is going to be uh, predicated on the fact that I believe, as I say, the inflation data is going to be slowing down sufficiently to allow them to back off. Because the Fed is trying to be, you know, is sort of, you know, pounding the table to the blue in the face, saying, "No, we're not done yet. We're going to have to go higher. Uh, we're at 425 to 450 now. We're taking that call the upper bound to 475, and we're ultimately going to go north of five if you look at their dot plot forecasts. Um, I don't think they're going to get there. Um, once again, it's because the predicate. I think the data will be softer uh, if it remains more resilient. They will go." Um, but if it's softened sufficiently, then they later on this year, they're going to be pausing. Uh, they've already stepped down from the pace they were increasing rates. They'll step down again, I think, to 25 basis points. And then the next step is, do they do another one in March? Or is that it for the cycle? And then just hold them where they are. Uh, and ultimately, I think, why if the uh, data slows sufficiently enough, then in the back half of this year, you're going to be getting closer to sort of the market either getting uh, rate cuts or at least the narrative within the market starting to sort of expect mm -hmm. that those rate cuts will be coming in the, uh, the latter half, uh, latter final quarter of the year. Perfect. Thanks. You're jumping ahead. Uh, I'm not quite there yet, though, but uh, okay. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, my next uh, question or point was uh, 2023 recession. And uh, if you... Uh, if you wish, break it up to U.S. and Canada or, or uh, together, uh, however you uh, want to tackle that yeah, one. This is the, this, these are the answers, yes. Um, do we need any more? So, uh, look, we're in a recession. We have to understand that, you know, the central banks, when inflation is running too hot, you know, the basic Phillips curve and the structure of trade off between unemployment and inflation uh, really says that to bring inflation down, you need unemployment labor market to soften, as I said. And the labor market soften, it, it just doesn't happen unless you have a recession normally. So in trying to increase you know, like a softer labor market, they're basically saying without saying, yeah, we expect to be causing a recession or we need a recession to generate the conditions to bring inflation down. Now that's predicated on normal and economic analysis. So where that may be wrong is the fact that there's nothing normal 
about this cycle that we're in before, as I talked about those, those shocks to the system. So is there a path forward that says, you know, we could see inflation coming down as some of the more exogenous factors sort of fall out of the numbers um, and uh, that the unemployment rate doesn't need to go up if you just see some of the realignment in the labor market. Um, so like I can stretch uh, analysis to say how you might get there, but I'm not gonna put that as a high probability of the outcomes and the more likely outcome expectation would be that we will see uh, sort of uh, a, a recession in both the US uh, and in Canada, uh, but not a recession and a recession isn't a four letter word. Yes. Um, it's, it's important to remember the last, you know, the leaving out the 2020 pandemic, um, you know, the 2008 and the 2000 recessions were driven by basic bursting of bubbles, okay? And the, it was the housing and financial uh, sort of uh, crash in 2008, uh, a tech bubble in, uh, in, in 2000. Uh, and these are very different. Those were the drivers of the inflation and though, or of the uh, recessions at the time. Those recessions, uh, when you have a popping of a bubble or something breaking, tend to be more severe when we have a recession that's driven by a central bank that's trying to slow down the economy and tighten. Because if tightening of monetary policy is causing the recession, then the solution to it is easing of monetary policy. So the expectation would be it would be a more shallow recession uh, than uh, what we've seen in uh, in recent times, uh, and therefore not not nearly as severe uh, to to markets. A lot of which has been discounted already uh, compared to what we saw in those past uh, past recessions. And then the caveat to that is is something going to break from the tightening, and that's one of those the things to keep in mind. Is I say that's it's, it's it's a possibility, but we've already seen some of it. John, crypto's broken. Um, we broke, yeah, sort of. Uh, you know, the UK broke the government with this, some of this these stupid stuff that they were doing. So we're seeing the stresses in the system and areas, but nothing that is currently going to be showing signs of significant stress or what I call systemic areas such as housing and banking in the last cycle. So it's much more peripheral areas, much more over-levered areas of the market, more speculative areas of the market. Um, and that's actually, that's a good thing. Um, yeah. You need to see those those uh, those uh, uh, excess speculation wrung out of the market, particularly when it's not, as I say, uh, in a very systemic part of the system. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you said that about uh, recession's not a four letter word. The uh... Uh, everything in life is cyclical. The recession is part of that. Uh, and it's a good reset. It also, quite frankly, I talk about this all the time. It's like a, a bit of a speed bump. It slows down that speculative market because if, if, if we were always just things are rosy uh, going up, uh, people just take on more risk and create more silliness, which yep. really is a self-fulfilling prophecy because then they, they create the downturn uh, yep. by and that's the public uh, is bigger and bigger so when it does burst it's going to be that more severe yeah and, absolutely and so that's, well that's, you you also alluded uh, uh alluded to this and uh really when things slow down and uh especially in a scenario like this when it's uh uh, uh driven by the central banks um if if they go too far it gets too uh painful uh what what do they do they look at rate cuts which is yep. a stimulus uh yep. and so uh you you did uh, talk a little bit about that uh, uh what's your thoughts and i i totally understand this is uh uh reaching out there but uh if we're looking at the cycle the way it stands today um when do you think we're looking at that and and one of the reasons for asking this question is uh, you you hear a lot, or I hear a lot from clients right now. Hey, my mortgage is uh, coming up for renewal in uh, two years, uh, one year. Uh, yeah. What what's it going to look like? And that's where, as I say, no, that's you're exactly right. And that's where I think one of the you know when when central banks pivoted this year to sort of front loading. And going very aggressively on the rate rising cycle, you know, part of that is also pathways realizing that by going fast, we know we're likely going to overshoot, and we'll have the ability to overshoot and come back if we have to. So I don't think it's it's not foreign to them that thought that if we've gone too far, we could bring it back, even if we're not going to go into an aggressive easing cycle. Um, and so if we've tightened too far, uh, and inflation is coming down and the economy is slowing down, 
they will start to loosen again. But one thing I will say, because they're so adamant about making sure inflation is wrung out of the system, compared to previous cycles over the course of the past 20 years, uh, when deflation was more of a concern, they will keep interest rates higher for longer than would have been the case under previous uh, cycles in, in recent years. So we are gonna have a higher uh, rate environment for longer. They will be more reluctant to cut and will do it slower. That doesn't mean they won't do it. And that's where I think in the back half of this year, it's likely that if the economy is slowing enough and inflation has come down enough, they'll say, hey, we went to sort of 425, 450. You know, we can take that back down to even if it's in the 350 range, which is still high by recent years standards, there's room to sort of cut down and see how kind of fine tune where it should be to get back the overall system back into a more sense of equilibria that I referred to before. So I do think of this a back half, there's a good chance, even as central banks will insist, they will not be cutting rates right up until the day they do. It's just the way central banks have to work um, because otherwise markets will undo what they're trying to do. So they are bluffing. It is kind of play a game poker. It is how monetary policy has to work. Um, but uh, as I say, I think back half of the year, we'll have the conditions in place that the, the rate cuts will be part of the narrative as opposed to further increases. Awesome explanation. Thank you. So w one of the things I wanted to touch on is, um, uh, so you talk about it being uh, rates stopping hiking now um, in, in inflation coming down uh, over uh, the next year um, and maybe rate cuts in uh, the back half of the year, call it next fall. Um, so the, the rate hikes take a while to sink into the system. And that's part of the reason why what, uh, what you're saying, there's, there's a lag on there. Um, so, uh, I often will say economies are not markets, uh, because markets are forward looking. Uh, yes. and so markets, you've said this a couple of times, they factored these things in already and markets are always looking and trying to guess where, where are the, uh, rate hikes going to stop? What's the terminal so-called terminal rate, the highest, okay. uh, and then at what point are they going to cut? And so we're the, the pain for a lot of it is, uh, uh already read into the market. Uh, yep. of course that's always open to surprises. Um, but what kind of opportunities are you looking for and what, what are you watching out for in this next coming year or two? Yep. And there's a very positive story here as well in uh, everything we've gone through in the past year. Um, and that is in, in the, the fixed income market, the bond market, it's back. You know, the biggest challenge we've faced for the past sort of decade plus uh, in terms of managing money, particularly for people who are retiring or saving for retirement, is the fact that interest rates have been so low, down to zero. We've had negative real interest rates. Interest rates have structurally been below the rate of inflation, which is a massive problem uh, for, uh, for the savings industry. I referred to it as the war on savers when interest rates were so low because you couldn't put your money in a so-called safe, less volatile asset and get a positive rate of You lost money in buying government bonds due to the inflation sort of uh, 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 price. So this war on savers is over. Interest rates are reset. It was a painful reset, John, last year. Interest rates from zero to four, everyone knows, you know, double digit returns in, uh, in, uh, in bond markets, just not something you expect. But when you look at from here going forward, I've now got interest rates, bonds that make sense. I've been buying bonds in some of the key funds I managed because I wanted to for the first time in my career. Okay, and I'm a historically an equity guy, but I've been involved in multi-asset stuff over the course of the past 15 years. We have bought bonds before for defense when you thought things were gonna go uh, sort of sideways, um, but I've never bought because, hey, this looks like, you know, a government bond, a 10-year bond paying 2% looks attractive. No, it looked attractive. You thought it would go to one, but it's not mm -hmm. generating enough income. We got like basic government bonds up to 4%. I've got investment grade bonds yielding 6%, and I've got high yield credit yielding 9%. Four, six, and nine are something we can work with in building portfolios to generate income for individuals, as well as that sort of protection, dampening volat of, for, of volatility has been restored 
into the bond market. And I haven't been able to say that in over a decade. And that's the positive environment because in compared to a sort of a one, two and four in the fixed income market, what can you do with that? So bonds are back, fixed income is back. We've been buying that and that's the highest weighting I've had there in a long time uh, in the bond market. So that is attractive and we've already seen that. Even if central banks raise at the short end, we've already got a very inverted yield curve, which is the markets are saying we're getting to the end of the tightening cycle. So longer term rates have already started to discount that. So war on saver is over, bonds are back where they're needed in a portfolio, we can use them again. Equity markets and where are the opportunities? We're in a bottoming process. They've come down roughly 20%. Canada's done a lot better. We have a lot of energy and, and uh, materials. So the one area that did well, uh, but generally global equity markets down 20%, reflecting the rise in interest rates, but we're still going into a recession. Everybody's looking, expecting a recession. Everyone's looking forward. It's not gonna be a surprise to anyone, but that doesn't mean when you sail into that storm, it's not gonna be a little bit bumpy along the way. And so the equities are still, as I say, still keep your seatbelts fastened, uh, certainly into the first quarter of the year, first half of the year. Uh, but I think we're in a bottoming process and there's a pretty good chance we've seen the bottom. And so being able to buy some of the dips uh, forward for eventually looking through to that recovery uh, in uh, later on in the year, as you say, markets anticipate these things. Uh, but I think for now, it's still kind of a sideways bumpy, uh, sort of keep your, uh, keep your seatbelts on in equity markets, look for the opportunities. Whereas in the fixed income bond market to say, those are, uh, you know, that's a pound the table. You can buy these today uh, where, uh, where, uh, where, they're, where they're needed and where they can be used. So there is some positive silver linings that come out of a, a generally uh, a painful year, such as 2022, sets us up for better returns as we look forward. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thanks uh, for reiterating that. It's, uh, I do often talk about uh, uh, these years like last year. This is where we uh, set up a portfolio uh, for the next three to five years uh, of uh, returns uh, because you're, well, some people panic and sell. Uh, we're looking for those opportunities and uh, your teams and uh, the other teams are are putting together uh, the outlook for these companies not only are going to survive through this, they're going to thrive on the other side of it. So uh, um, I, I think that's a really key point. And this is where people ought to be putting money that's sitting on the sidelines. If it's long-term dollars, and that's the key point, if it's long-term dollars and you can put up with uh, your, your psyche, <laughs> you can put up okay. with volatility, uh, buying in these low points is without a doubt, uh, 10 years down the road, you're going to look back and go, wow, that was, I, as always, I wish I'd done more. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Drummond, any, uh, any other parting thoughts uh, from you as we close this out? The one I'll just throw out there that, uh, as I say, we didn't talk about, don't take your eyes off China. Really interesting what they're doing there with, you know, dropping the COVID zero, ripping the Band-Aid off, uh, and just almost going for herd immunity all at once, from having basically complete lockdown to no restrictions. Um, really interesting dynamic there, uh, and uh, massive infections today, but saying, hey, that could lead to a a, a accelerate a, a faster recovery than we would have expected had they remained in that lockdown period. So China, really interesting things going on there right now. They've been in lockdown. There's, there's that potential for unleashing uh, a sort of a pent up demand as we've seen playing out in the West when they remain in lockdown uh, could be could be interesting. Uh, but it's going to come with uh, some pretty dire news in terms of the number of infections and fatalities that will be part of the process. So that's just one, as I say, parting thought is, as I say, you can never completely take, take your eye off the, uh, the, uh, the second largest economy in the world. And uh, it's going to be an interesting year overall in 2023. I think, yeah, same dynamics. Inflation, monetary policy and geopolitical surprises will continue to keep us busy. And as I said in the opening, repeat. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There we go. Well, that's awesome. Uh, Drummond, thanks so much. I know we'll touch base uh, probably partway through the year again for our listeners. And then again, uh, next year uh, uh, to, to see to see how you did. We'll check your scorecard. Exactly. Well, we'll, we'll get the scorecard out. So yeah, all the best in 2023. Thank you. A big thank you again to Drummond Brodeur for his insight and expertise as always. Our next planned podcast is speaking with an expert on interior design. 
Many of our clients are building, renovating homes, offices, or commercial space. So I thought I'd tap into my local expert at Kara Interiors for a peek into the benefits of using a designer. And what are some of the telltale signs that using a professional may make sense for you? Ultimately, our goal is to educate and engage you, our audience. If you have any topics you would like us to dive deeper into, please let us know. If you could take a moment to post a review, it would be much appreciated. If you would like access to other videos, podcasts, or articles we have done, visit us at saunafamilyoffice.com. And for those of you who don't know the origin of the name Sauna Family Office, it stems from the meaning of Asante, which is Swahili for thank you. However, the most commonly spoken phrase in Swahili regarding Asante is Asante Sauna, which means thank you very much. This name represents the gratitude towards all of the families and business owners who have chosen our team as their trusted advisory council. Until next time, Asante Sana. Hi, I'm Trevor Beggs from Sana Family Office, and thanks for listening to John Lawson and the Wealth Wisdom Podcast. Here are the necessary disclosures. Asante Capital Management is a member of the Canadian Investor Protection Fund and Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada. This material is provided for general information and is subject to change without notice. Every effort has been made to compile this material from reliable sources. However, no warranty can be made as to its accuracy or completeness. Before acting on any of the above, please make sure to see a professional advisor for individual financial advice based on your personal circumstances. The opinions expressed here are not necessarily those of Asante Capital Management. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next time on the Wealth Wisdom Podcast.